So, Ed, thank you very, very much for coming and chatting about um, about miniatures, isn't it? Yes, or uh, it can be very generic, but uh, I think probably the uh, the hook in for me, which was Warhammer Forty Thousand, which is sort of Warhammer behind me. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Those space also, marines on the t-shirts as well. Yes, um, that was uh, <laughs> that's where, where, what that which got me into miniatures painting, and then of course takes into historicals and uh, fantasy and uh, and everything else and of course trek miniatures which we've um, uh, which we make great use of here on the hailing frequencies channel absolutely absolutely so so coming on to so is it is it gaming with miniatures that sh that's your big thing or painting the miniatures or is it just like a mixture do, do the two go hand in hand yeah uh, with me it's, it's very much both um Obviously, we spent I probably spent a lot more time painting and, and modeling than doing the gaming itself. Um, particularly the past couple of years, a lot more painting time than than gaming, which is good. Uh, the, the pile of plastic shame is is being slowly whittled away just to add more stuff to it. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a balance. It's a balance of the two. I, I, our own particular gaming group does um, does sort of darkly comment that unpainted miniatures roll no dice. So uh, we always make sure that things are painted to play with. I like that. I like unpainted miniatures roll no dice. I like that. So, so with miniature, uh, let's say with miniature gaming, then because obviously the the painting is a means to an end in in that regard. Right. So, so I'm an alien. I've never visited the planet Earth before. I've just landed on the White House lawn. I've come round to see you for a cup of tea, because I know you're the man for the cups of They're tea. Definitely for tea. <laughs> um, and you're going to explain to me what miniature gaming is as an alien who's yeah, never been on Earth before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you assume every race has got some sort of tabletop gaming, but you just... Have... <laughs> Simulating war where the only thing that gets hurt is small plastic models um, or we settle our differences on a field of honor that's about six foot by four foot across um, using mm -hmm. using dice to random to randomly determine the results of things that could happen um, God, how would you describe it yeah we because we, it's a case of sometimes we reenact things you know if you do a historical game you're, you're reenacting it or, or pulling out a, a what if scenario what what if this unit had had uh, a different type of equipment or what if the terrain had been different or the weather had been different um or simply what if you know eight foot armored genetically enhanced humans went stomping across the galaxy murdering every alien race they find i mean probably not what you want to say to a welcome in Yes, famous Raylan. I'll, I'll explain Inquisitors to you. Yeah, yeah. Says, welcome to the forty-first <laughs> millennium, and and the very and you know a, a dark a dark and satirical look at nineteen eighties Britain. <laughs> um. So so is, I'm I'm guessing then it's a very strategic, heavy game. And there's a little bit of there's a little bit of both. There's a little bit of the, the sort of heavy. Again, it depends on depends on the games in question. If you just stick purely to uh, the the Warhammer Forty Thousand game itself, um, it, it's a tactical miniatures game. So it's about what's what's happening inside of the enemy, rather than anything big and logistical in the background. So it's you know, what does this particular squad of troops or this particular tank? How does this affect that enemy squad and trooper tanks? What am I best putting up against that, or what am I best putting into my army so they all synergize together and can take on broadly what I'm likely to come across in a galaxy of many different factions and races, you know, some which are melee combat orientated, some which are ranged combat orientated, some which are psychically magical powered orientated, some with small amounts of elite troops, some with masses of chaff troops, you know, horde, horde uh, forces. Um, so yeah, there, there is, I suppose there is a strategy back there of, you know, building your army um, in the background thinking, you know, what am I going to take on? Who do I have in my gaming group? You know, I know Alan has Chaos Space Marines. I know James has 
uh, Imperial Guard, and so, so you know, and I'll have to take on tanks there and elite troops there. And what have I got? What 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 are my strengths? What are their weaknesses? Um, yeah, it, it, there's there's a lot to it to that. And then of course it's putting it on the table with a plan, and then watching it fall apart as the dice roll. Yeah. Exactly what you don't need. <laughs> no plan survives contact with the enemy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, so to to my mind, and and tell me if if I'm either on the nose with this or if I'm utterly, utterly wrong, was the original miniatures game chess? Probably so, yes. Yeah, in, in terms of like a, a tabletop war game simulation, chess. Um, yeah. In terms of longevity and it's, it's it, you know, pretty much it's spread to every corner of the world, really. I mean, even by the Middle Ages, it, it was being played as far afield as what, China, Africa, across Europe. Um, and and it, you know, even the Dark Age versions that we found in Britain in archaeological digs, and I can't remember the name of it, but the one up in the, in Scotland, in the Shetland somewhere with the, um, the Viking um, style mm. pieces, which you can get reproductions of. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally, every war game is chess with additions to it. So whether or not you-, you Extra you still, steps. <laughs> exactly. So it, I mean, you mean you still get you still get war games that are very much like chess with a gridded board that you move pieces or even counters. Um, there were some war games, there were some Warhammer um, war games that came out in the nineties, which were large scale. Um, in some cases, free with the magazine. In some cases, bought ones, which were map based. So everything was hexes, uh, hexagon shaped, and you had little stacks of tiles, and each counter represented you know, an entire regiment. A, an entire chapter of Space Marines or an entire legion of Titans, and you move them and then have combat charts and dice rolls and stuff. To be fair, I find those a little bit dry. Um, right. Those sort of count, counter and hex war games. I mean, some people, they, they are a big seller. GMT games do a lot of those, particularly uh, historical ones, but I've always found them a little bit dry myself. I like, I like something to, to drink in visually with like, models and terrain and scenery. We often joke in our game that our, our group that some of our games take a very long time to play because we stop halfway through a turn and start crouching down to the end of the table, going, "Oh, look at that! Look, that's cool! Get the cameras out, start taking pictures." Of it. <laughs> but that just adds to the sort, the sort of story thing. You know, you're playing a, a game; it is on paper competitive. You're both trying to win the game, or there's a there's a, you know, a mission objective or a scenario to deal with. But at the same time, you, you're telling a story, and when something you know, when one unit makes an amazing last stand or a, brilliant charge which breaks the enemy line and that's like it, it's heroic and it's it's you know it's a story that everyone's been part of sharing and everyone can appreciate and enjoy it i oh, remember that time that unit of yours did that and, oh yeah well, if, if they do particularly well you maybe paint something on the model afterwards as a little little battle honor or something so <laughs> my uh, my niece it's... my niece does that mainly with skulls because she always beats me <laughs> <laughs> excellent i mean it sounds very complex is, is it easy to pick up to uh, like someone with, new to it like with many games it, it's it's um it, it's easy to learn difficult to master um and with a lot of like with a lot of modern gaming systems you add on uh, almost modules of complexity as you and the people you play with want to um hmm. so you, know, you could you could literally play it with you know, children like my my daughter's age and i have done and it's literally just move them one stick length and roll the dice and see if you hit it, blam, you've killed it. Or you can, you know, go into the advanced rules for cover and morale effects on, you know, troops and weapon types and uh, all sorts of psychic powers and other tactical strategic cards that you can throw in as well. And, you know, lists of abilities and counter abilities that stack up and you can add on and you can, you can go in as deeply as you like, or you can play it very casual and just roll some dice, move some little toy soldiers around and murder your enemy mercilessly. <laughs> and everyone goes home safe at the end, apart from your little toy soldiers who go back in the box until they get killed next week. <laughs> now, you mentioned playing it with, with your little ones. Going back, I'm guessing, all the way to your own childhood now. Uh, I make that sound like it's a long way away. I didn't mean to. Um, but what <laughs> what was your first memory of either the gaming or or the miniature painting, or what what's your earliest recollection? Uh, well, in miniature painting, I th I think probably um, my dad helping me or doing some for me for my model 
um, model railway when I was when I was younger. Um, so those have been like um, double O scale models, mm. which are ooh, sort of ish size. Um, but obviously those are with oil-based paints. I think even you know, the old Humbrol ones that you might find on um, uh, Airfix kits. Um, mm -hmm. um, but from, uh, and obviously um, modeling those um, and Airfix kits myself, but in terms of like, Warhammer and actually war gaming, um, Space Crusade was the, um, the, first, uh, the first infection vector for me um, as a, uh, I think that would have been Christmas 1990 when that uh, came out, late 1990, that was on the Christmas list and arrived. Um, so it was a case of like pulling, not clipping, uh, it wasn't, wasn't as advanced as that, literally just twisting all the, mo the, the models out of the sprues, assembling them, putting them all together and finding out these incredible, these, these incredible space marine, these, yeah, these are armoured space warriors with all these different types of guns and orcs and Gretchen and chaos space marines and androids and gene stealers with four arms and all sorts of horrible stuff. <laughs> but the board, it was a it was four piece board that each board could piece could spin around to give different layouts and a, a big sort of 3D wall panel that went in the middle to break it into sectors and door doors that went down. So I was yeah, that was um, that was amazing. I remember trying to show my, my younger brother it, and he didn't really have the patience for it. So I had to wait until we sort of got back got back from school holidays and some of my friends who hadn't got it but wanted to play were able to come around and we were able to sort of work it out and probably not play the rules particularly well. But <laughs> we got moving stuff stuff around and it was it was good. There was there was lots of lots of entertainment value there. Space Crusade takes you into warp space to fight the force of chaos. Deep in a parallel universe where nightmares are real. Space Crusade, the ultimate adventure game, where you must use all your skill and weaponry. Plasma gun, dreadnought! To battle through infested starships and win the highest rank. The ultimate encounter is here. Space Crusade, now with a new adventure pack. Wasn't and for a while. It was a few years after before I actually started painting uh, the miniatures themselves. And uh, as with many, my first attempt was with oil-based Humbrol paints and was not very successful. Um, it was it was later repainted, and I'll, I'm sure there'll be. Um, I have evidence of it. I've still kept that original model somewhere. Um, and more recently, I've actually repainted my um, original Space Crusade set uh, in in my more my more current style. Um, to to be used so that me and the girls can game with that uh well now or when they're a little bit older as well so you, you've been painting for a long time now i think that's fair to say very nearly 30 years very early, very early night so i think i think 93 was when i first got a, a, like the proper paints for this um so yeah it'd be late 1993 or 94, no, 93, uh, I start, started painting, um, sort of more seriously getting into it. And um, with a little bit of a gap at university when I was still painting, but just didn't have much time to, um, pretty much ever since. Um, with uh, increasing or de decreasing uh, regularity. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in increasing regularity now, I've probably got a lot more painted um, the past couple of years than, than I have uh, I have subsequent uh, previously. So it sounds very much like from the gaming side of things, you, you get a lot of sort. Of, there's a, a big social aspect to it, and and a lot of sort of fun with friends. But what about the painting? So because that's much more of a solitary activity. I at least in my head it is. Yeah, so what what does the painting give you? It is. I mean, there's in. I, Thinking about it, what, what, what does what does painting give you? Well, it, it gives you a very tangible result. I mean, I sort of, I, mean, I always uh, break them into little projects. So, as whether an individual character model or a squad of something that can be used in the game. Um, and it, it, obviously, you have to be patient. You can't, you know, they don't just spring out the box. You've got to, you know, trim them, assemble them, maybe, maybe pose them as well. They're multi-part poses. So get the um, get the arms and the weapons in the position you want or the equipment that you need. Um, that you may have chosen beforehand uh, and then obviously undercoating them painting them detailing them and then finishing them off but i think it's the end of the um like the 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 satisfaction of like you know, look at look what we achieved you've got something here and then taking it 
and being able to use it in a game and in some cases even like the acclaim of your fellow gamers as well because there is that kind of like um how's that kapow aspect of and here's my new unit which you haven't seen before and it's coming out for you tonight <laughs> and they're sort of like oh wow <laughs> I mean, it does paint a massive target over it because the first thing anyone wants to do is kill the new unit. Um, <laughs> just, just to prove it's not invincible. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's sometimes, I mean, it, it's great because they've not seen it before. So they're like, oh, yeah, let's have a look at that. That's, that's it. So that, again, adds as to the social aspect as well, because I always say it takes ages to get the game going as well, because half the time it, it's show and tell beforehand. So you get around to someone's house to set up a game and you're like oh look at this new thing i don't know i haven't seen that since last time i was here and everyone's like oh look at that that's brilliant <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier about the competitive aspect with the gaming so, so is there a competitive aspect to the painting then there are painting competitions yeah i've never i've never felt confident enough to um to enter one because in, in, in amongst my immediate gaming group i'm by far not the best painter um amongst uh, amongst them um that would be if he's ever watches this that would go to mike who is definitely an artist at this um on the minor side it does take him like three months to finish a model off but when he does <laughs> it's amazing um so he still he slogs through uh in the, at his own speed but again that's his uh that, that's his his painting style but yeah the the competitions you can get I mean, from uh, local gaming store level competitions right up to national um, competitions for um, for painting styles and um, either people enter units, people enter individual models. Um, yeah, the, the, the skill that's out there is phenomenal. Um, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm really just painting up nice 3D gaming tokens to play with um, and here, here and there picking up a new, a new a new trick to make them look a bit better but on the whole I think I think I sort of plateaued a few years ago and most of my models now seem to be a, look about the same and I'm quite happy with them I'm quite happy with how they turn yeah. out good tabletop standards fine for me and I'll, I'll do the eyes I'll do the eyes and stuff on the characters and the generals eyes I mean that's like that's detail that really is detail um I remember seeing a it was a space marine when I was a kid so this would have been like yeah, end of the eighties, uh, and I remember seeing a space marine model, and he, and he was, he didn't have his helmet on, and they'd actually done obviously a skin tone on his head, but they'd done like five o'clock uh, yes, shadow. Yes, yes, the, 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 um, the absolutely <laughs> incredible. incredible. Um, you know, but it was like the the just the faintest shade of grey above the skin tone. It was like really impressive that mm. just blew me away um now no hobby as we know is perfect at all um if you could change one thing about either the painting or the gaming side of miniatures or miniatures in general what would that be I th mm. there is an old joke that says that gamers only complain about it, two things uh, was it how the rules used to be and what have they done to change them? Um, <laughs> there, it, certainly with, I, I think people would say certainly with, with Warhammer in all its many, many forms is the, the continual updates. Now that's, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I mean, it's, it's a game that's always evolved. Um, it's now in its ninth edition um, mm -hmm. since it came out in the 80s. And every edition has had a slight change to the rules, change to the, the, the tempo and the way it's presented. Um, you know, I, I played a, a small amount of it, but mainly painted back in the second edition. And then I pretty much just painted and didn't game until the eighth edition came out. And again, our, our little gaming group, a couple of them got these sort of um, start collecting sets. And they'd said, oh, we're just going to make some little armies and see how this new version is. And that's when I went back to the, to the garage and found my old Eldar army was still in there. And I sort of dug it out and went, hang on, have I got enough here to make to, to build an army? And it's, yeah, and so I managed to get a load of old metal models, a good excuse to repaint them and build an army, which is now about 2,000 points worth and, and growing um, over the past few years. But a lot of the problem is that the whilst you're just getting settled into 8th edition, they brought out ninth edition and changed how the format of all the books looks. And I don't like it. I like the 8th edition. <laughs> um, they, they, did, they did, a lot of those changes were for competitive tournaments. So they, they made 
in some ways they rewrote some of the rules to make it very unambiguous about how you read it um right whereas i mean amongst a group of friendly gamers we read the rules and, and we figured out what it is they're intending or we just come up with a rule on the fly to to judge it yeah. and then we we go with that um but obviously for, for tournaments where there are prizes at stake in some cases cash prizes at stake and in some cases people have spent an awful lot of money in one of our own localish tournaments at, in stockport i believe there was a couple of years back there were competitors there from singapore who'd come in at wow. manchester to to take part in like a whole weekend um warhammer 40,000 tournament which, which is significant i don't think i'd go quite that far just to play board games <laughs> not ports quite far enough <laughs> maybe, maybe birmingham um but um yeah i, th I think the I'd, I'd say the the constant changes are something that's that's good about it and something that's very something that's bad about it is more annoying than anything else i mean hmm. but then again as a gamer you can say well eighth edition we know how those rules work we've got all the books that work for that we, we just play that I mean, in our own yeah. group. Um, and, and there's plenty of people out there who actually play this, but the, the, uh, the second edition, the classic 1992, 93 version, I still play to those rules. In fact, I think if you look on YouTube, some people put up um, battle reports with it, with the, the uh, traditional bright goblin green bases on everything as well. Everything, everything was grass green. All the planets yeah. in the universe were grass green with trees. <laughs> no lava planets there. Everything's, a, everything's an M-class planet there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So so if there's constantly changes coming through, um and I I mean I I remember I, I can remember original lead models. Mm. So I'm going back obviously a long, long time now. Um and then the metal ones and then then they start producing the plastic kits like you mentioned. Um so on the on the gaming side, yeah, they, there's always going to be changes. But what about the painting side? You, know, you say you used to paint with oil paints, and that's evolved. Yeah. Um, what What's next? What's What's down the road? What changes can we expect on the painting side? Well, I mean, you know, te technology has advanced. I mean, from uh, the the obviously the oil based paints were never really a thing, uh, no, officially with, for example, Games Workshop products. They were always in, um, shown painted with acrylics um and and for many people who start off you know going to acrylic paints for the first time is a, is a great revelation you know they just wash off with water they get really nice flat colors they mix nicely um so you, you don't you don't need white spirit to get them off your brushes afterwards um <laughs> so that was that uh, was um for me that was a that, the great revelation and and it was something that we actually um i took well, we took further because my dad um took what I was doing painting as a teenager I was like watching because he was um, a very very talented uh, in in art anyway um, and uh, towards the end of his life he became uh, an icon writer for a church that he was involved in uh, an orthodox church and he sort of practiced some of the icons using some of my uh, acrylic paints um, to get like the right mixes and he'd come in and say oh I, I need this color for that robe and he said what's that one I thought oh, it's goblin green it was <laughs> <laughs> chaos demon red is that oh you go and get some of that then so he's painting religious icons with like chaotic demonic red or tentacle purple and stuff like that and he'd come in and say have you got any of that tentacle purple like, yeah you can borrow that one um which was good and then obviously he'd, he'd mix up the sort of the, the proper eggshell paints for the, the proper ones to go in the church so that had um that had a, that had a positive effect and <laughs> And, and his icons live on in that church now um so, and also things like how to, how to paint jewels because i figured that oh i've I'd seen a um a tutorial in one of the magazines of how to paint jewels like doing like a block color and then at the bottom doing um like a slightly lighter color and then a very much lighter color and then a spot of white in the corner and it gives the impression of a of light shining through so i showed him how i was doing it on i think it was some eldar waystones on their armor and he's like fantastic he just took that and he started doing that in his icons as well so they're all painted um the sort of standard games workshop jewel uh, <laughs> <laughs> methodology um, which i thought was, thought was very cool um so yeah fr from that obviously we, we've the biggest change we've had probably in the past 10 20 years i suppose is airbrushes and contrasts uh, and a lot of people use airbrushes now to get to get um, some amazing um uh, effects um and obviously Miniature airbrushes are so affordable now, and you can do a whole tank 
in five minutes. Um, I don't have any airbrushes myself, but a friend of mine did give me a go with his. And I think we did a, a squadron of, of P-51 Mustangs in sort of polished aluminium um, in about five minutes. Just, just sprayed them over, wash of black, and they were done. Just needed the transfers on and off, off into the sky as they went. Um, rather than actually having to hand paint them all on. It was um, a, re a revelation. Not something I've gone to myself yet, but um, uh, I may do. But yeah, the, the contrast paints they brought out the past uh, two or three years have been probably the, one of the biggest revelations where literally the, you do a, a light undercoat and these contrast paints are a, a mix between a paint and an ink. Um, and when you literally just paint them on one layer, fairly thick, leave it to dry, um, the sort of the, the viscosity of it means it sinks into the recesses and comes off the edges. So with one paint, you get shade, highlight, and base color all in one stage and leave it and it's done. Um, I go back and I re-highlight it and, and tweak it a bit further. But for, for starting, uh, for, for new painters, they get some amazing results really quickly, which encourages them to learn new techniques and get their armies painted now on tables playing when it means more painted armies which it means more things are rolling dice which is good um so that's that's a we tested i tested that on my on my niece who was getting into painting so we we did her whole space marine army in just contrast paints and uh, from that i was able to to then start saying right i'll have one of those contrast paints for me as well and that's a good one <laughs> to our so it, uh, it worked well. So that, that's that's probably the future. I mean, we think a, a blend of contrast and traditional is uh, is what a lot of people are using now, but um, they're a really good way of getting stuff painted very, very nicely with at, at a very early stage of your painting skills. You, know, you can get good results quickly. Mm. So without contrast paints then, um, simple, simple question now, a quick question for you, uh, dry brushing or washing? both why not both um why not indeed <laughs> no, it, it, it depends it depends on the model depends on the area of the model so i mean for example i would uh something with hair it was really like a as a wizard i did the other week he you know, had the like long flowing mane of hair oh, how we wish <laughs> <laughs> memories <laughs> um and yeah, that was a very simple um, contrast, actually, and then a dry brush and then a wash. So contrast to get the basic uh, depth of colour and lighter colour and dry brush over the top just to highlight it. And then just a wash just to sort of blend the two together and um, sort of make them less harsh, make it more more like hair rather than um, uh, rather than armour plate. Uh, yeah, little three, three, three step stage and a nice result. And then, and then just leave it because you can go to you can keep going and keep going, keep going. And. Eventually you say, no, that's it. <laughs> We're done. Get it, get it <laughs> yeah. on the table. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So if if somebody wants to, you, you mentioned like you're a you're member of a, a group, a gaming group, um, and there are various gaming groups around. Where could people, if they wanted to get into this, this as a brand new fledgling person in the hobby, where would they go to find out more information? Well, the internet is probably the best place to start. Um, I mean, if, for, for example, if miniature gaming generally, I mean, there's, there's so much out there, but I would always say, have a look and find maybe a local friendly game store that runs um, gaming evenings. And certainly near me, Element Games is a great place to start in Stockport. Um, they have a whole gaming center attached with dozens of tables. And if you go in there for an afternoon, um, there'll be people playing all sorts of games. So fantasy games, sci-fi games, historical games, card games even. But if it's miniatures games that you were interested in having a look at, you can have a look at what people are playing. And then what's most important is to go for what inspires you, what really gets you. And you think, well, that's cool. So it might be that you see the Space Marines and go, yeah, they look, they look cool. Or you might see some sort of elves in a fantasy setting or uh, Lord of the Rings from the, uh, from the uh, recent films, miniatures of which there's a lot, and think, oh yeah, I'd love a, a Riders of Rohan force, or I'd love to command some Isengard Uruk-hai of my own. Um, or you might think, yeah, I'd really love some US paratroopers storming the beaches at D-Day. All of this you can, you, can, you can find, and you can make a start with a fairly small price point with um, a box of them, a set of paints, and lots of, of small gaming stores will have an area you can sit down and they'll usually have some staff there who'll show you how to make a start, you know, clipping them out, what bits you need, you borrow their bits and pieces to assemble the first ones. 
get some paint on them and then they'll point you in the direction of, of what you need. And obviously places like YouTube as well will show you how the games work, how the different models work. And there's some fantastic, there's tutorials now on all manner of painting and gaming that we never had back in the 90s. Mm. We, had, we had to wait every month until White Dwarf came out and see what they were doing this <laughs> month. And that, and that, that I've still got a stack of old White Dwarves. Yes, yes, I've, I've got from, some. From I've got the some, 80s. I've got yeah. some somewhere. But again, you see that most of that was um, like battle reports and um, modelling projects and pages and pages of painted models to give you ideas and um, because that was the only media you could um, back then reasonably to yeah. yeah but yeah i'd say yeah. Look, look look around places like that look on the internet look on the internet and find yeah if you if you if you like the idea of painting and gaming with models find the ones that really inspire you um the ones that really hook you in um and and that will that will drive you to to collect and to paint and and to and to do them to do them your way do them your way is most most important but make sure they're painted <laughs> they don't roll dice. <laughs> and what about your personal the the painted uh, the, the miniatures that you've painted or the games that you've played is that sort of out in the public somewhere where people can find it or uh, yes i am on uh, instagram as uh, you might say as firelock22 i am um, out there available anything anything i paint i put up there uh, i am available for commission work if you if you that's uncertain of your painting skill. I can certainly do stuff for you. Um, and uh, I do usually put on, um, I have an on tabletop um, page as well. Well, my projects go up on the on tabletop website, which is another great gaming resource. Um, they have a YouTube channel and um, just a, a great website of uh, a community of gamers from anything, board games, video games, and um, miniature gaming. And uh, people put up their projects on there so you can look at what the other people are doing. And, uh, and be inspired by that as well. That's uh, a good spot to go. Excellent. Well, we'll stick links up so that people can find that. Um, absolutely brilliant. It's obviously something you're very, very passionate about. It, uh, it, it, keep, it, it keeps me from, yeah, it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always inspiring to hear. Ed, thank you so much for doing this today and for, and for talking to me about the whole miniatures thing. Um, we'll see you on the Bridge of the Livingston, of course. Oh, of course. Thank you very much, Stu. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to chat about anything geek related that we that we love so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care. Thanks, Stu.